Thank you so much, Dodo and Noni. My dear friends, I mention in particular our President Pip and Wilma, and of course uh, the former or the past President Mara and Dainari, and uh, all of you, mga Iksuun sisters and brothers in the Lord. I was talking at table, I'm a little bit afraid that Dodo Anone may make a longer introduction than my sharing now. <laughs> but I like what Dexter said. Uh, masarap subay bayan. The rest of my talk subay bayan na lang ninyo sa Cebu, no? Because I intend to host the uh, Eucharistic Convention, the Priests Convention, the Seminarians Convention. No? So we will meet uh, more often in Cebu, and I think that's a good excuse that uh, I will not give a long talk this evening. I was also sharing with my Lucky Homes and St. Joseph unit in, in, in Iloilo, I said, I feel more like a member of the family than a guest speaker uh, because I had been a chaplain of the CFM in Haro no, for nine years. In fact, what I'd like to share, to be very candid with you, is the sharing of a fellow delegate in the Synod of Bishops for the Evangelization uh, and the New Evangelization for Transmission of Christian Faith, uh, a sharing by Father Rene uh, de Guzman, of course, with his permission. He is the catechist in the group and the youth coordinator, and that's why I took the liberty of borrowing his PowerPoint presentation. There are only seven frames, so uh, I can do it in seven minutes, or if you want, uh, in 21 minutes now. Uh, after which, with your kind permission, I'm driving back to Manila. At the outset, uh, before, I, before I forget, I'd like to invite you formally to the International Eucharistic Congress in Cebu in 2016. Of course, especially, of course, uh, Father Damon and uh, Monsignor uh, Manri, uh, Mani, and of course, all of you. I repeat, the last Eucharistic Congress in the Philippines would be 79 years ago in 2016. So this is an event of a lifetime. And I also would like to inform you that in 2016, the theme is actually in, on the family and the Eucharist. By the theme, I mean the theme of the preparations for the fifth centenary of the coming of Christianity in the Philippines. Uh, every year we have a theme. This year is on faith formation. Next year, Lady, 2016, Family and Eucharist. And then 2021, Mission Agentes. Just to, to show how important uh, the connection is between Eucharist and the family. I'd like to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank the Cebuanos for being very patient with me. Uh, what do I mean? Before I assume uh, office, I was invited to celebrate Mass of the Santo Nino, and after the Mass, as expected, there is the Sinologue. I participated in the Sinologue, and then the Hermana Mayor approached me and said, Archbishop, the way you dance is not sinulog, yours is cha-cha. <laughs> but, but of course, they were patient with me. Last fiesta of the sinulog, I uh, opened up with the sinulog and nobody complained. So I think I must have done the right stepping after two years. <laughs> I, I just mentioned this because an interviewer asked me, Bishop, do you think that because the belfry of the Santo Nino was destroyed, this would affect the devotion? I said, no, this would increase the devotion to the Santo Nino. Amen? Amen. The title of a portion of Father de Guzman's PowerPoint presentation is on the youth and new evangelization. And without much ado, I'd like to comment and frame number one, it says, 
the Synod Fathers. The Synod Fathers are optimistic about the young, while at the same time concerned that they are exposed to various forms of aggression. Put very simply, there is a certain ambivalence when we think of new evangelization and the youth. I repeat, on the one hand, there is a certain optimism and hope. On the other hand, there is a certain uh, reason for concern. And the explanation is simply because of the condition of the youth. Years ago, there was a study made by A.G. Carlos on the outlook of the youth. Again, we can see this polarization, this optimism, and also this uh, fear. On the one hand, there are young people who, when they look to the future, look at the future with hope and optimism. And these are the young people who have experienced support in the family, young people who are given the opportunity to have a solid education, and young people who are in many ways connected with the church. They look to the future with hope. On the other hand, there are young people who, when they look to the future, look at it with an amount of fear and apprehension and anxiety. And the reason is, when they look around, they see unemployment. They see were. There is the destruction, the erosion, the crumbling of human and Christian values. And these are the young people who would resort to drugs and alcohol, to the erotic and to the exotic. And as we often read, these are young people who many times have come out of life and commit suicide. These are realities which to us in the Synod should be a cause of concern, while at the same time, as we said, we are not pessimistic. On the contrary, we have optimism. I just underline this point because we have a choice and we have a task. Frame number two, 88. The Synod Fathers recognize how the youth are filled with, quote, deep aspirations for authenticity, truth, freedom, generosity, to which we are convinced that the adequate response is Christ. When we look at young people, we see many who are indeed filled with aspirations for authenticity and truth and freedom and generosity. I will never forget on one occasion I was in a plane. I was seated with a young girl. She opened up the conversation. What's your final destination, Father? I said, L.A. And I said, yours? She said, San Diego. And she started to open up a conversation. She was asking me about how to channel their foundation. What would be or who would be the best recipients of the, you know, the foundation that they put up. And I asked her, what's your profession? She said, I'm a lawyer. And I said, uh, and your brothers, she told me, one doctor, one dentist, no, and another, uh, a, a CPA, you know, all professionals. And then I said, how come they are, in fact, all single? No, they are new professionals. I said, how come at your young age, you're already thinking of helping people back home in the Philippines. I was inspired. And I, she said, you see, when I was young, when we were young, our mother would often bring us to the orphanage, to the old people whom they visit. And she would tell us, hopefully one day when you have the means, find a way you know, to reach out to other less fortunate sisters and brothers. Believe me, you know, for a bishop like me, you know, 
Such uh, conversation really made me believe young people have indeed this aspirations for generosity and also to reach out to others in the name of charity. And I thought we should recognize this in the, in the young people. And that's what also the Synod is telling us. We want to support them in their search and in the goodness that's in their heart. Amen? Amen. Number three, frame number three, eight to nine. We encourage communities, one, to listen to, dialogue with, and respond boldly and without reservation to the dif difficult conditions of the youth, to harness and not to suppress the power of their enthusiasm, to struggle for them against the fallacies and selfish ventures of worldly powers, which to their own advantage, the advantage of worldly powers, dissipate the energies and waste the passion of the young, taking from them every grateful memory of the past and every profound vision of the future. Listen and dialogue with them. In the message of the Synod, which I'm sure many of you must have downloaded or read, there is a reference to the woman by the will of Sikhar, John chapter 4, verses 4 to 42. If you have time, run through the whole message. It tells us of the situations of many, especially of young people. First of all, the woman by the well is a symbol of people, all of us, but many of them young, who are thirsting for something, hungry for something. People recognize there's a yearning in their heart. And they go to the well. Question, what if the well produces polluted waters. We know that not every well is safe. I mentioned this because one time I was talking with a friend and she said, Bishop, I watched a documentary last night. It's a documentary of a certain people in, in a barangay who would travel to another barangay just to fetch water. They would bring it put it in the cans, in containers, and let the carabao or the cow pull, you know, these containers of water. And she said, you know what's sad? When they analyze the water that they fetch in another barangay, the water is also contaminated. It's another, you know, uh, kind of contamination. I think that reality is true, not only with physical waters, but sometimes you know, with the many supposed to be quote-unquote answers to the thirsts and yearnings of people. The point here is, if we listen to them, then we know that you know you can guide them. But just to point to the message of that uh, story, the woman with the will of Sekar, the best pointer we can make is to point to the fact that in that well there's someone sitting there and this is Jesus. If you read the story towards the end, the woman would say, He told me who I am. And he made the woman realize what she is in fact thirsty of. She's thirsty not just with ordinary water. She's thirsty with a loving relationship. She's thirsty with the relationship with God. She's thirsty to worship God in spirit and in truth. I think our role is to listen in dialogue, to listen, to sit down with people and listen to them and to point to them that there is someone who could tell us who we are and tell us what we are thirsty of, especially, I would say, for the young. Listen and dialogue. 
I know in many places now, no, there are hosting of World Youth Days, and uh, of course, we can participate. We should harness the power of their enthusiasm. And I, I'm happy, of course, when, uh, when Pip and, 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 and Wilma mentioned about what we can do, you know, to, to help them against the fallacies and uh, selfish ventures of worldly powers of mass media and, and all of these things, because this is very important. Okay. Frame 90, please. The Synod acknowledges that the world of the young is a demanding but also particularly promising field of new evangelization. The Synod Fathers noted that the young can be evangelizers to their own peers. Hence, their active role in evangelizing, first and foremost, their world is to be recognized. Here we say that the young are the best or can be very good evangelizers to their own peers. In Cebu, after the joyful event of the canonization of San Pedro Calungsud, the young people opened a Facebook, BNP, Barcada ni Pedro. And I think they hit thousands of, you know, uh, 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 of uh, members. No? And the, the, the tenor is, is just, I pray for you today, or may I ask your prayers for, you know. And uh, there's a lot of interest, and they're happy to share how, you know, young people would say, I feel down and low today. Could you please pray for, you know. And, and you know, they would just uh, respond through the Facebook. I thought y young people, you know, are, are, have a way of reaching out to others. In fact, some of you may be familiar with Pedrito. Pedrito is a doll. But one time during the CBCP, the youth asked of us whether we can endorse Pedrito. We're a little bit hesitant because Cardinal at first was a little bit, you know, like, why a doll, you know? But the background was, there's a little boy who was uh, asked whether he would like to be a saint, you know? And he said, what's a saint? Then he mentioned about Pedro Calongsor was martyr, you know? Oh, martyr, that's too, you know, uh, scary for some little boys, no? When they make the little doll, Pedrito, and they said, well, this is Pedrito, you know, uh, the young Pedro who went to Guam, you know, and spread the faith, and he became a saint. No? And some little boys you know, would say, yes, I want to be a saint. Anyway, when after the break, we asked his eminence, eminence, would you endorse Pedrito? And I said, kung ikalalaganap ng dibusyon kay San Pedro Kalongsod, payag na rin ako, no? So, the young doll Pedrito, which is a doll and should not be blessed, you know, but is a good reminder of what young people also aspire to be, meaning to be saints, uh, is, is now in, in the market. Parenthetical remark, you know. When Pedrito, when San Pedro Calongsod was, was scheduled to be canonized, all of a sudden, there are many Calongsods, you know, all over the Philippines, you know? There are Kalungsuds from Hinatilan in Cebu. There are Kalungsuds from Mulo, Iloilo. There are Kalungsuds from Buhol. There are Kalungsuds from Leyte. And so we said, sainthood is relative. If you become a saint, then you, be, you know that you have many relatives. <laughs> but now, because he is a saint, we said, no, he does not belong to one region. He belongs to the world. No? And actually, on November 21, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, will bless the mosaic of San Pedro Calongsod at St. Peter's Basilica. That's beside the tomb of Paul VI. So the two Filipino saints, San Lorenzo Ruiz and San Pedro Calongsod, have their image or mosaics at St. Peter's Basilica. That's about San Pedro Calongsod and about sainthood. Tulo na lang tulo. 91, please. Proposition 51 reads, the youth and new evangelization. This proposition echoes the word of the Synod Fathers to the young in their message. 
In the new evangelization, the youth are not only the future, but also the present and the gift in the church. However, this proposition highlights the way for the young to recognize and believe in the church, quote, through exemplary Christian adults, the saints, especially young saints, and through committed young ministers. Put very plainly, the young looks at models. As we often say, values are caught, not so much taught. No? And most of us would recall, why do we value prayer? It's because when we were small, we were told to pray. Why do we value participating in Sunday Mass? Because Saturday afternoon, they prepared our clothes or dresses for the Mass. No? Why is it that uh, novenas and processions are important? Because we were brought along. Uh, in these novenas, especially when the adults, when the parents are models for the children, when they would say, my papa, they taught us to respect people, they taught us the value of work, they taught us to be fair, to be honest, you know, then we know these are the young people who would be leaders and eventually evangelizers also to their fellow children. Stories like the story of Chiara Luci Badano, you know, very active youth leader offering her life and joy and song to the Lord. She got sick. She offered her sickness to the Lord. Now, of course, it's blessed. Beautiful story. You know? and, and all of these things, they inspire the young people. You know? Frame 92. The Synod outlines the steps of evangelizing and ministering to the young. Wherever they are, at home, in school, or in the Christian community, it is necessary that evangelizers meet the young and spend time with them, propose to them, and accompany in following Jesus, guide them to discover their vocations in life and the church. When I recall, for instance, how young people appreciate being not only listened to, but guided in their vocations, I recall with a certain amusement, no, but now with gratitude, my own secretary before, he studied in UP, and one day he heard, you know, uh, a, a bishop preach a retreat and he asked a few more questions and he decided to try the seminary. His father would not allow him, but he said, Papa, this is my life. At first, the Papa did not like, but when he knew the son was determined, he gave him his blessing. Now, he is the rector of the seminary in Kalbayog. I sent him to Rome for studies. My point is, you know, for those who search, they're happy when people of experience like us na, would just tell them about, you know, vocation, whether it is religious, you know, or, or uh, in a profession for that matter. They need help and guidance. And finally, 93, to balance the great influence of media and the physical, emotional, mental, spiritual well-being of the youth, the church through catechesis and youth ministry strives to enable and equip them to discern between good and evil, choose gospel values over worldly values, and to form firm faith convictions. I always remember with uh, a sense of appreciation how, especially parents, train their children in, uh, as we say, spiritual values. A fellow, a colleague in the seminary once went to Africa and shared with us how parents train the children to be generous. And he said during the offertory at Mass, he saw a mother carrying a child at her back. And the mother went in front 
and put her donation to the collection box. And then she came back and joined the line. And then she, she followed, you know, the queue. And when she reached the, the collection box, she did like that. And her little child gave her his own collection. We thought the mother is telling, I'm giving my own share. I will make a line for you. You are uh, an important person. You also share. You also give your own donation, you know. I, I thought, <laughs> no, why would you make another line? No, but making another line for the little child, I believe, no, also gives that wonderful idea. You are someone precious, different from me, and whatever sharing you give, that is an important uh, decision too. Making faith decisions. Last story. A bishop shared with me that the Etas in Pampanga, the stunt barangays, would often be visited by other, you know, other sects and congregations. Anyway, so after some time, they would give noodles and rice, etc., etc. But then, they came to a point when they were proselytized. And then they say, could you give us your images, you know, because that's not supposed to be the way you should worship, you know. And you know what the Ita said? You may stop coming over. No, we need rice, but if you take the images in exchange for your rice, no, we would rather have, you know, our images rather than your rice. So you may not come back again. I thought this too is part of faith formation. Rice may be important, but if it means, you know, throwing away what you also consider as spiritually significant, then they're making faith decisions. My dear friends, I said, sabay-bayan dala natin yung iba pang seminar sa Cebu. You are most welcome in Cebu. And as I said, uh, especially after November 30, when I would end, you know, my two-year stint as CBCP president, then I have more time in Cebu. You may drop by 234 Hakosalem Street, you know, and uh, that's where I live. I have plenty of coffee and, of course, dangit, you know, and pusit. No? And uh, if you are a CFMR, just tell me, as bishop, I am a CFMR, you know, and uh, rest assured, uh, not only coffee, perhaps, but also some cookies. No? So, meantime, uh, dagang salamat no, for this wonderful experience. And see you in Cebu no, for future events. Please pray for us because we are a huge archdiocese. But thank God that the Cebuanos are patient and we need one another. As the great, I think, as Bishop Kamara would say, if we dream, and that's very important, if we dream and dream alone, perhaps that would only remain a dream. But if we dream the dream of God and we dream as a community, we dream in collaboration with one another, let's believe that in God's own time, that dream will become a reality. To all of you, dagang salamat, and see you in Cebu. God bless.